Uh, welcome to the last day of Reimagining the Future Earth and Global Justice Days at Sac City College. I'm Riyad Bahur. I am the coordinator of the Global Studies Program here. Um, really pleased to be offering this and other programs through throughout the day. I mean, I'm really excited about this session in particular. I've been looking forward to it for, um, for a while. Um, this is Introduction to African Studies, Major Trends and Insights with Ibrahim Rabatunde Anova and Oluwashola Daniels, um, both scholars of African history at UC Davis. Uh, Ibrahim is an African affairs analyst and fellow at the Center for African Prosperity of the Atlas Network, and he's managing editor of AfricanLiberty.org and a board member of the Initiative of, for African Trade and Prosperity. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees in Nigeria and the UK respectively. And he's currently a PhD student in African history at UC Davis. Oluwashola uh, is a PhD student also at UC Davis. She researches African sexuality, nudity, marriage and cultural studies. And she taught African history and feminism for nine years in a Nigerian university before coming to UC Davis. And she's published 11 journal articles, uh, which are linked to actually in the agenda on the main site for, um, for this event. So really happy to have you. And without any further ado, I believe that Ibrahim is starting us off and then he'll hand it over to Alua Shola. Um, and then we'll, we'll have some discussion at the end. They will tell us a little bit about their take on uh, major trends going on in African studies today and then uh, tell us about their own work or an aspect of their own work. Ibrahim, thank you for joining us. Go right ahead. Thank you, Rian, uh, yeah, and thanks for everyone for joining the presentation. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh, again, as uh, uh, the prof said, my name is Ibrahim Babatunde Anoba and I am from Lagos in what is today Nigeria. And um, I am studying African history at the University of California at Davis. And um, today, my colleague and I, we're going to be like taking you through what we consider as, what we consider to be some of the major trends and highlights in African studies, pretty much giving the most basic introduction to African studies as much as we can. And um, I, I, I have divided my presentation into two phases. Uh, the first phase will be about some of the three categories of insights or, or, or trends in African studies. And the second phase will be about my, my own research agenda. I'm, I'm still in my first year, so my research is still in the, in the arch phase. So I'll tell you what it's about. Uh, so the, the first category of of trends I've identified or, or insights rather, are what I call, you know, cultural and spirituality cohorts. And um, I think this is added two of the most fascinating in terms of interest uh, from, from scholars and students in African studies. When you talk about African studies, oftentimes people will talk about one of these two categories, frankly. And you have culture, which, which you know, oftentimes the most dominant uh, channels of study within you know, African culture has to do with African literature, uh, the creation of, 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 of reflection, how Africans have reflected with their environment about the self, about the society, and how those reflections are evident in, in works of poetry, uh, nonfiction and fiction across time and spaces. And oftentimes when we talk about African literature, some people will only think about the modern or the colonial literature, when in fact, uh, African literature dates back to many, many centuries. I mean, we, we have evidence of African Africans writing what you can consider to be poems of different genre during the ancient Egyptian civilization. As far as that, even before the birth of the prophet of Islam or the bed of Jesus, we have you know Africans writing, producing literatures. And I deliberately chose the picture in this in this circle because it's one of the manuscripts from, from the G's uh, collection. 
and the Giza language was, you know, developed, some people will say about 2000 years before, but we have concrete evidence of um, these manuscripts, this, this specific one from at least um, uh, between the fourth and the fifth century BC. Uh, so yeah, a lot of people go into that field to study this, this, this imagination, this, this literature. And of course, a lot, of people also go into the study of visual arts. And oftentimes when we talk about African visual arts, we, we think narrowly about, you know, sculptures or paintings or drawings. Uh, when in fact, those things are African arts, but they go beyond that. They're about the identity, the culture of people, the religion, the spirituality of the people embodied in these so-called arts. And again, I deliberately chose this picture because this is one of the pictures I think from Metropolitan Museum where you have this collection of West African arts, stolen West African arts, or as we really, as some, some would call it artifacts. And you know, we've had scholars trying to figure out what has become of these arts since their removal from Africa. In fact, even before their removal, why did Africans document their experience through these arts? Because they tell modern philosophy, they tell modern history, they tell modern identity. So we have a very, very prolific field in, in African visual arts. Then the language formations, which of course, of course, ties to literature, and uh, it, it, of course, everybody knows now that you know it's it's it's, it's a fallacy to think that Africans uh, took forever to start writing down their thoughts. We often think the you know the ability to write comes from some of the Mediterranean or European civilization, when in fact Africans have been writing since the time of the ancient Egyptians. There are evidence of writing in Great Zimbabwe uh, to some of the Bantu cultures that have now evaporated. So the, a lot of people also go into that study of language formations as well. Then very interesting field of philosophy. Uh, until like more recently, at least in the last six, five decades, have uh, we seen this huge interest in, you know, seeing African philosophy as something belonging to the mainstream philosophy, when in fact, uh, we may, of course, we have a lot of, you know, um, Kudos to give to individuals like Kofi, I'm uh, sorry, Kwesi Weredu, some of the most prolific modern African philosophers. But the idea of Africans philosophizing dates really back to, in fact, as I said, ancient Egypt. I was reading uh, a three volume piece by, I can't remember the name of the author, but it's about you know, the mortuary texts and the, uh, the, the, the tomb site texts from ancient Egyptian burial sites or sites of, of burial. And how some of these texts they about they give you an entry into the philosophy of the ancient Egypt. You go to Ethiopia, or or or, or the, um, the 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 Tigray region, and you see the Gies manuscript. A lot of them produce philosophy. One of the most prolific among them is this piece written by Zara Yaqub, I think in in the in the seventeenth century. But even before that, way way before that, you have a lot of people in Africa philosophizing their thought, not only as individuals, of course, when we talk about group philosophy or society philosophy, think about people like the Yoruba people who have this strong corpus called Oduifa corpus. And people often think about Oduifa as something that is religious when it's in fact, it's a body of philosophy created by a society or a community from, from generation to generation. So a lot of um, scholars often go into that field of African philosophy as well. Then you have the very popular category of performative arts. And I think this is that side of African cultural studies that has gone the widest uh, in terms of you know, music genres, you know, dramatization, talk about Afrobeats, talking about performative arts in Africa. Uh, but sometimes when we think about you know, the arts of music production or dramatization in Africa, a lot of people think about the emergence of the uh, the, the 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 moving theater or the traveling theater in 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 the late nineteenth uh, uh, century or the images of Afrobeats from the colonial period when in fact both the theater production and the Afrobeats culture all take uh, 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 their their, their images from practices of sound con you know conditioning or imaginations of rhythms from way way back. Uh, to ancient Africa, to medieval Africa. Uh, so a lot of people also study that as well. Then the, the aspect of customs and law, and this is one of the most interesting fields for me because I also deliberately chose this picture because this is a picture of a governor from Western Nigeria uh, in, the, in the state of Iba, uh, Oyo State. And of course, we know about the Oyo Empire, but there's also a state called Oyo State in Nigeria where you have this governor 
giving the staff of office to the king. And a staff of office is the most significant symbol of authority in any Yoruba kingdom. But not only does this picture just show three, I'm sorry, three individuals, but it says a lot about how African customs was pretty much modified or changed during the emergence of European presence. Because you know, the Europeans came to Africa, they, they stole the power from the kings, they seized the power from the kings, the monarchs, and gave some parts of those power to the monarchs. And in, in, in the process, giving them the staff of office saying, you know, we are the superior, we the Europeans are the superior authority. And you, the king, are only a subject uh, and you're only a medium between us, the Europeans and the natives. So in that process, giving the king, the white, um, uh, the white governor, giving the king, the staff of office, and this tradition has continued up to today when you have this Yoruba king, Yoruba governor giving a king the staff of office when it should be the other way around. Um, and also, you know, we talk about religion as well. And this is one of the most prolific areas in African studies. Uh, you know, when you study this people's spirituality, their, their imaginations of the cosmological forces and natural forces, and, you know, how humans and plants and, and, and spirits form the earth, how they form the world, how the world works. So uh, it's, it's a very broad field on its own. And more than in, in, in much more recent times, we've seen this push by, you know, Africanists, particularly in the religion, field of religion to separate uh, folk medicine from, from African religion studies. Uh, because not only because, of course, I mean, folks, folk medicine is, is a huge part of African religion, but it's also deserves its own space because it's so comprehensive. And there are now universities, degree awarding universities that not, do not belong to the mainstream, that are so structured to give degrees in separate courses, I mean, separate discipline of religion, and also a separate discipline of folk medicine. Uh, and the second category of insight is uh, what I call um, the study of spaces, the, both geographical space and human spaces. And of course, we know about the huge interest in climate studies in Africa, not only because of the problem of climate change, but also to reckon with how Africans have imagined uh, the, 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 the climatic forces around them. I mean, if you go to the deep history of the Nilotic tribes or the Nilotic peoples, I'm talking about the cultures along the Nile from, from what is today Sudan to Egypt, you see studies of calendar, studies of time, studies of soil, that days that dates way, way, way back before uh, to the, uh, the, the before the beginning of, of the common era. Uh, our Africans in this region have created calendar, have created you know, plants planning or planting or, 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 or uh, irrigation by, by encountering or studying the soil and whatnot. So climate studies in Africa is another major field of interest that doesn't, you know, started. Uh, in the current period, it's, it dates back to, 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 to the ancient times. And of course, the study of ecology, and this is perhaps one of the most controversial fields in African studies, where you have this, um, you know, dominance by European or scholars from the global north, be believing that because they spend six months or one year doing research in Africa, then they understand what's best for the conservation of hippopotamus or the conservation of elephants. And, you know, you have you know, these African groups or, uh, communities fighting back, saying, we know what is best for our animals. You know, poaching may not be good, but uh, it's also a, a strong aspect of our own economy. And you can't just come from Washington or from London and just say, you know, we must take all the land from the people and create a park. So ecology, the study of, you know, African animals and plants and the relation with the environment is another very prolific field, prolific field of, of study within African, African study itself. Then you have the category of, you know, study of human spaces. And this is where my own field of history comes in. You know, so interested in, in seeing how uh, peoples and ideas and society have evolved across times and how uh, uh, certain forces inform how those changes emerge. You also have the, the study of African migration. Uh, and this is one of the great problems because a lot of people often think that migration studies in Africa is much more of a modern invention because you have this huge number of Africans trying to get out of the continent through the Mediterranean Sea, then that's what informed this 
new interest in African migration studies when in fact that's not the case. Uh, we've seen Africans across the world, presence across the world since the time from, from the ancient times, frankly. I mean, we have evidence of African presence in Roman British and Roman Britain, you know, ended around 84 BCE, uh, sorry, 84 um, common era. We have, you know, evidence of African presence in, in, in Asia, evidence of African presence in what is today Jerusalem and, and Iraq. Even way before the prophets of Islam and you know, Jesus were, you know, come, come to life. So Africans have always migrated to all these other spaces. I mean, black Africans, frankly, and, you know, their, 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 their presence in these environments, what became of them, how they negotiated power, spaces, honor, or, or opportunity with, the, with other um, people within the same physical space are some of the questions people try to understand in migration studies uh, in, within the web of African studies itself. Then you also have the Pan-African cultural studies. And this is a picture of Barack Obama in Ghana at some time during his presidency. Uh, which is a point where we sort of see the uh, inseparable uh, link between cultures on the continent and culture of the African diaspora. So a lot of interest have also gone into studying how those cultures move from the African continent into New York. How, for example, the Harlem Renaissance, you know, took its some of its uh, main component from African values how Africans were kidnapped and trafficked during the slave trade, retained certain cultures, how their, their new cultures were formed or were influenced by new, uh, newly adopted values in North America, in Europe, in Brazil. Sort of this very large web of movements of African cultures across times and spaces. Then the third major insight is, you know, what I call the African realities in, in politics and resources. And this is where you can talk about much more modern conception of academic field. For example, the study of trade in Africa is, of course, trade is as old as human in Africa, but the, the proper study of it, the economic side of it, the, the modern economic calculation side of it is not too far in, in time. And here we're interested in questions about how exchange of goods and services and knowledge produce opportunities for people and societies across Africa or questions like, why is Africa poor? Why is the abundance of knowledge in Africa not translating into uh, equitable development, economic development on the continent? And, and how does politics inform those, those changes or the lack uh, thereof? And there also is interest in economics of human development. As I said, why is Africa poor? Why uh, as the enormity of, of funds that have gone into development projects across the continent not translated into development. And this is where you have feel like economics, African economy, African political economy, uh, African politics. In fact, my bachelor's degree was about African uh, political economy or political science, where I focused really strongly on the intersections of, of Nigerian politics and the, and the Nigerian economy during the, uh, the Fourth Republic. I also have political systems. These are pure study of governmental systems. And this is perhaps one of the most popular or the most prolific part of African studies today, where you have um, students across universities in the, in, in the global north really interested in questions of how Africa's place in globalization, or Africa's relation with the external world, uh, how it is shaping up and how it has shaped up since uh, the independence, the end of independence in, uh, 1960s and 1970s. But also on the other side, you have the study of, you know, realities in terms of resources, the human resources in Africa, or the, the translation of African knowledge into economic development, or what some people call the entrepreneurship question in Africa. Why, why I, is the abundance of knowledge in Africa not translating to, you know, development, the technology? I mean, we see this huge interest by, you know, Silicon Valley companies, Google, Trade, Twitter, whatnot, going into Africa, investing in the people because of the promising um, level of technological competence they see in those spaces. But how has those investments impacted the society? How have they um, helped or otherwise not help uh, these African communities or African entrepreneurs access development? Or without the presence of the Silicon Valley, how has these entrepreneurs themselves in their local space try to negotiate opportunities through their own knowledge or their own creation. 
So a lot of others, a lot of interest go into the study of entrepreneurship as well. Then of course you have the geological part because you know we have human resources, but we also have natural resources. You know, sometimes people are trying to question in this field of ge geology, um, why the abundance of resources in Africa has been pretty much of a curse, or maybe also approaching the same question from another angle. That's why, as in the resources, you know, fully created, you know, opportunities for the continent when in fact you have the rest of the world utilizing Africa's resources to, to pretty much develop. And how, for example, you know, the questions here links to the questions here. Is China in Africa because of the resources of Africa? You know, all these triangular or multiple connections between you know human resources and natural resources and questions of politics and trade. So those are the three major insights I've identified in, in African studies. And I guess my colleague Shola will talk more about it. But now I want to talk more about my own research. Or even before I talk about that, I think one of the things we can identify from the foregoing is that, you know, African studies oftentimes focus on these four questions. You know, we're trying to correct the historical and anthropological misrepresentation, misrepresentations that have happened over time. Our Europeans have written about Africa during colonization, before colonization, or even after colonization. And many of the interests in African studies today are because we want to create the correct impression of Africa, the correct history of Africa, the correct societal constructs of Africa in the academia. And also people go into African studies because they just want to understand modern Africa and its peoples. And also they, because they want to study African imagination and realities. In fact, today you see a greater unprecedented interest in um, Yoruba religion among African-Americans or even among Africans in, 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 in the Caribbean. And the reason why this interest is so huge is because the imaginations of Africans, of Yoruba society or Akan society or the low society is just so fascinating to the rest of the world. And you know, some people do not even go into African studies because they want to get a degree, but just because they are so fascinated about the imaginations and realities. And of course, a lot of people also go into African studies because they just want to understand the place of Africa in the modern world. Climate change, uh, the, the threat of a third world war, uh, the, 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 the proliferation of insecurity across the continent, terrorism, all these are questions that people want to understand how Africa plays, uh, how Africa plays across these questions. So these are some of the four reasons why African studies is so prolific today, so driving a lot of interest. And these are some of the, um, the degree being offered across North America. And I know they go beyond this, uh, but for some of our colleagues in the community college, we want to go into African studies, uh, beyond the community college, these are some of the degrees you may uh, want to pursue. But also, I identify in the last part of this sentence, uh, as I said earlier, the degrees that are, not, that are being offered by unconventional academic institutions. For example, one institution I would encourage anyone to check out is the IFA University in Virginia, where you can also have you know, degrees in, in religion studies, but also in folk medicine and other categories. So now to my research, and I hope I can finish this in, in the next three minutes. So um, as I said, I'm in my first year of the PhD and my research question is still ongoing. But for now, the central question I hope to ask in my dissertation is uh, the changes in social mobilities of women and children during the Yoruba civil wars and the emergence of European presence. Uh, that is, that century between 1760 and 1860 is a century of warfare and slavery among the Yoruba people in West Africa or what is today Nigeria. But that century sometimes we're relegated in the, in the academia and we only see through the experience of war, through the experience of monarchs, through the experience of the Europeans. But there are other demographics that made up that century of warfare, particularly women and children that are not being properly put into the framework of analysis. So my research hopes to bring the experience of women and children into the analysis of that century of warfare and slavery between 1760 and 1860 among the Yorubas. And some of the secondary questions that I hope can help answer this central question are, first, uh, what, is the, what are the changes that happen uh, in terms of how the Yoruba define womanhood? Like during this century of warfare, the definition of womanhood changed? Did it move? If at all it did, how did it happen? If it did not, why did it not happen? Because oftentimes we see you know, personhood or womanhood or slavery being defined 
during the process of war across Europe, across the Middle East. So in this case, did it happen in, among the Yoruba? And the second question is the question of childhood as a category of social constructs. Uh, the, 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 the ability of a child to join a war as a conscript, does that make the child become a man or a girl? Or does, does, does it make a girl become a woman? Because I mean, if you, if you, if you become part of a war, so in some cultures, that's a performance of masculinity to some extent. So did that happen among the Yoruba children? Or if it did not, how did they place in, that, in, in, in terms of social construct during this period of warfare and slavery. And also another question is the modification of the women's negotiation of power and honor. Uh, and I know this is one of the critical things we've seen in the post-Civil War era in Yoruba land. I'm talking about from 1860 to about 1999. We've seen that a lot of key points, a lot of key contested points in terms of women's studies focus on how women negotiated power through the court, through the colonial court, and negotiated honor through the native institutions. But my question here is that how did women, how did they negotiate power during this war period itself? Did, did they do anything to, to demand more honor from the men, from the society? And if not, why did they not do that? Another question is also the impact of European presence on native imaginations. You know, I talk about imaginations a lot in, my, in the earlier part of my presentation, but I also wanna see the changes in the Yoruba imagination from the angle of women and children, if at all anything happened, and how the changes in those imagination can help us rethink the creation of the Yoruba imagination after the war, after colonization, or even during colonization. Because oftentimes this period, it's 1760 to 1860, is not you know, broadly researched to include Yoruba imaginations, to include the formation of poetry, dance, performative acts, and whatnot. And lastly, uh, what are also the contribution of women and children to the warfare itself? Because as we have come to, to know in terms of you know, warfare, the Second World War, even the First World War, we are now seeing that even though a lot of women may not have fought in the war as you know, compared to the number of men, but the role of women was so integral to the outcome of the war itself because they may not be conscripted in the field. They offer a lot of services to the men who go to the war, their wives, their daughters, their emotional support. They are also you know, friends. They are concubine, sometimes they are prostitutes, but they offer a lot of services, a lot of key of a lot, they give a lot of offerings to the outcome of the war itself. So did the same thing happen during the Yoruba warfare? Did women play any part apart from you know taking up guns? You know, and did this you know contribution contrib you know change or can help us reimagine the entire outcome of the civil war, uh, Yoruba civil war era itself? So these are the questions I hope to ask in my research. And and with this. I think my 25 minutes is up, and uh, I I want to thank you for for your uh, for your attention. And you can always reach out to me uh, through this means. And now I will pass the the baton to my colleague Oluwashola Daniels. Yes, thank you for that wonderful representation. Yes, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I'm Oluwashola Daniels, and. Um, I'm here, of course, like he said, to give a talk. And I want to start you know, my presentation with this video. So I'm gonna share my screen in a bit. So, yes. Just wait. Do you speak African? Well, neither do the 1.1 billion people in Africa. There's no reason the nation of Africa cannot and should not join the ranks of the world's most prosperous nation. It's not actually a country. It's a continent of 54 very different nations and more than 2,000 languages. But it's constantly misunderstood or misrepresented. Any mention these days of what was once called the Dark Continent conjures up lazy images of war, famine, corruption, or disease. Who has time to mention the 22 Nobel laureates from nine different African countries, right? And guess where four of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world are located? Not in Europe. Yep, they're in Africa, which of course has issues with poverty and in three Africans is middle class. And the continent is one of the fastest growing markets in the world for mobile phones. And guess which one of these two places is in Africa? Wrong. But all this growth comes from foreign aid, right? That's where most of the money comes from, surely. 
from Western handouts. Nope, not true. In fact, foreign aid represents only 2% of Africa's total GDP. In 2010, Africans living outside of Africa sent more cash back to their families at home than the rest of the entire world provided to the continent in foreign aid. How about the plight of poor African women? Well, the continent has had seven female presidents. The United States, still waiting, I'm afraid. Meanwhile, Rwanda has the highest proportion of female parliamentarians in the world, 64%. Over in the UK Parliament, it's a record 29%. But you know what? It's important that we focus only on the doom and gloom across the continent, because every 60 seconds in Africa, Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for um, watching that. That's the kind of um, uh, prelude to what I'm about to say to my presentation because uh, it gives a background to the reign of um, misconceptions, ignorance and um, imposition hegemonies that is still in place about Africa. So it goes to show that even um, after many centuries, you know, up to uh, 2015 or 14 thereabout, people still regard Africa to a, 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 like uh, a country. And I remember my, my course, the course I'm saying for, I, 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 I remember asking the student that, uh, what do you think of Africa? They said, oh, Africa is like, it's just like a place where you have, people living in villages, people living in um, poverty, people having a, maybe like a kind of culture because they are all black. So maybe like a, a culture and always very poor, always very homeless. You know, then I, 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 I kind of, you know, got it that the first thing that should be done when you're speaking about Africa, when you're studying Africa is to be specific. Okay, there should be what is called specificity. So you just have to be specific. You have to go straight to the point. You have, you, the generalization is a big problem. Okay, and specificity is, uh, is something you find in the major trends in African history. Okay, so we go to the major trends now. So I'm gonna share my screen on my slides. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm coming just a bit. Yes. Yes, slideshow. Yes, major trends in African history. Um, so the very first thing is that um, being specific is to all also say that one of the major things that has, has um, made everybody like everyone outside Africa to have misconception about Africa is the problem of slavery. And generally this uh, transatlantic slavery. And uh, when you look at history, you will discover that almost all peoples have been both slaves and slave others at some point in their histories. In other words, it's not specific to Africa, it's not specific to the black continent. And for instance, when you talk of the Ottoman Empire, you talk about uh, the, the Mamluks, the Mamluks were slaves. And also uh, in Europe too, you will discover that slavery and slave raiding have been part of a European experience long before the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. It was most widespread in the continuing conflict between Christians and Muslims in the Mediterranean. And uh, there and around the Black Sea, slaves were created as each side enslaved the other as part of the spoils of war. So it started before um, the Atlantic slave trade. It's not really like it's intrinsic to Africa. So I'm still going back to my specificity debate. So there's need for specificity to address misconceptions about Africa. Yeah. And um, it is usually or generally also uh, said that because it was after this this man had ruled Mansa Musa, like uh, he, he was uh, the uh, the uh, king of Mali, the old Mali Empire, not the current Mali now. Okay, let me just put that there, king of Mali in 
the 14th century. So as the king of Mali, he had access to a very rich reserve of uh, gold, gold that when he traveled across Africa, even outside Africa, he crashed the price of gold until now because of the gold reserve at that time, he's still regarded as the richest man of all time. So when uh, many kings in Europe had of him and of the rich reserve, the rich resources in Africa, they sent uh, Vasco da Gama to go to Africa. And um, uh, the, the, the first person to do this was uh, the Portuguese uh, king. That was uh, through the exploration of Africa, uh, then uh, 1497 to 1499. And when he got to Africa, he discovered that uh, Africa could form, could be a route between Europe and Asia, because they were also looking for trade routes. And of course, they got to know that Africa could be a connecting point between Europe and Asia via the Indian Ocean. So when he went back, of course, the Portuguese king came and plundered the Swahili coast, Mozambique, for a very long time. So that was the beginning of the Atlantic slave trade. Yes. And Africans resisted this human plunder like uh, King Afonso of Congo in 1526 wrote to the king of Portugal that his people were kidnapped because what Dagama did was to first kidnap Africans in their boat, to kidnap them and take them forcefully to Europe because he believed that they were just black, of course, they are less human, so he took them. And um, I must also say that there was also, apart from transatlantic, there was also trans sahara trade. Africans were taken to Iran, uh, Baghdad, uh, Middle East. But the major difference, I must say, of course, I was still, circle back to my specificity, is that at this time, many of the Africans could use Islam to set themselves free, to navigate freedom. For instance, there was the Zang revolt. There was the Zang revolt, and they got their, some of them got their freedom, and they left slavery. And many of them were easily assimilated, such that you don't find the, 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 the struggle for assimilation in those areas like you would find in the post-Atlantic slavery era in the Americas and Europe. Yes, and after the abolition, after the abolition of slave trade, there was uh, the Berlin Conference uh, in 1884-85 to generally it was to consolidate slavery. Of course, slavery at that day, there was abolition. So there must still be something again to continue that. So there was colonialism, and they partitioned Africa according to the various interests of uh, uh, the European powers at the time at the conference. And they came into Africa, continued the plunder, and of course, took as much as they wanted. And in the World Wars, the first and the second World Wars, over 1 million African soldiers fought for the European colonizers during the Second World War. And I, you know, we often hear that. It was the Atlantic slavery, it was the Atlantic slavery, the Atlantic slavery handed in the 19th century. Why is it that everybody's still talking about it? What about the 1 million African soldiers that fought for their colonial masters at, that, at this time? So there must be something to that must, that specificity must be put in place for everyone to know that something also happened at that time. And post independence after, uh, the Second World War, post-independence gloom. Of course, there was the problem of uh, a place just colonized, definitely the resources taken away. There was a the problem of uh, independence, grunts, and um, uh, having to consolidate and to even generally to develop. So they needed, they needed infrastructures, they needed money, they needed so many things. So that's, crisis, that struggle for survival made many of them to become prey again, many of the African states to become prey to their former uh, uh, rulers. And for instance, France continues to thrive on new colonialism in the name of maintaining foreign reserve worth over $500 billion for 14 African countries each year since 1961. 
examples um, Benin, uh, Burkina Faso, Guinea-Bissau, and the rest, and the rest like that. And um, nonetheless, nonetheless, or for this, because when you look at the specifics, you will discover that it's been uh, centuries over centuries of uh, of um, uh, underdevelopment of plunder like that. Nonetheless, Africa has fast growing economy, young population group that is crucial to the development of any emerging economy. And um, in agriculture too, uh, the coffee export from Africa is valued at nearly 2 billion US dollars in 2020 with Ethiopia leading the exploit, uh, exportation. And then um, there's cocoa too. West Africa collectively supplies two thirds of the world's cocoa crop with Harikos leading production at 1.8 million tons. And um, uh, before, before I go to this, before I go to this, uh, I'd like to say that the essence of this part on agriculture is to show that, is to show that Africa, regardless of uh, the, the gloom, the doom or whatever, that Africa feeds itself. It feeds itself and it also exports to other parts of the world. So when the world speaks of, uh, of, um, of um, hunger, when everybody speaks of hunger like nobody ever eats in Africa, they should also know that Africa exports many crops out of Africa to different parts of the world. Yeah. So, and there's low record of death from COVID-19. You have two, five, as of, uh, I think yesterday or so, two, five, three thousand deaths compared with over a million in North America. Because rem you, we all remember Melina Biget saying that, oh, she says uh, Africa uh, littered with deaths of many people across the streets everywhere, but that is not the case. So there should be specificity on that too. Then there's high record of female uh, leadership. Uh, of course, this is the latest, uh, the picture of the latest uh, Tanzania president is uh, female and uh, uh, she's Azan. And um, that is to tell us that uh, one of the post-independence gains of uh, Africa is uh, about uh, gender equality and um, women in uh, leadership, especially at the apex. Like we saw in Rwanda having 64% female parliamentarians in that uh, Al Jazeera video. And generally feminism, one of the post-independence intellectual innovations is, uh, Afri in Africa is about the feminism. And why is it? Because there is cultural plurality. And when you talk of plurality, there is that need to be specific on it because many, many scholars, many scholars in the West, in the East, generally in, in global feminism, they, they talk about gender as category of analysis. For instance, John Scott is popular in the United States as even beyond the, the United States talking about gender as category of analysis. But when you get to Africa, is gender really a category of analysis? No, gender is so many things and so many things are categories of analysis. So there sh should be stark and definite distinctions. So this takes me to my own research because of course I'm a gender historian. My work is on African gender history and I am working on sex, marriage, uh, nudity and um, sustainable development goals. And probably I should just say a bit about how I came about my feminist consciousness. I came about my feminist consciousness because while uh, uh, in secondary school, of course, growing up generally, you'll be told that, okay, you're a woman, you're a girl, don't play too much, you don't use the ball to play, you don't use that to play, you're not a boy, you have to stay in the kitchen with your mother, you have to do this, you have to do that, don't do too much, don't do that too much. Okay, but well, getting to the university, I discovered that I don't have a different matriculation number as a girl. I don't have a special seat as a girl. I could sit with everyone. So it's made me to think again about that thing that I grew up with. So I then discovered that this is something that, I, that really interests me, that would make me to think about African culture itself. And I also discovered that uh, virtually all families uh, at least in Yoruba, in Southwest Nigeria, that you would discover that they have uh, at least history of 
one woman, at least one woman having marriage by, you know, through different means and having children to more than one husband, not polyandry in this case, not polyandry, I must say that, but having children to more than one husband and with the society not saying anything. So why is it that I grew up in patriarchy like everyone breathes, eats, thinks about patriarchy? So this takes me to my work. Yeah, so the title of my work is uh, Fluid Conjugality, Sexuality, and Agency in pre 20th Century Nigeria. And of course, I'm also a first year PhD student in, in University of California, Davis. So this is like uh, my beginning. Um, I'm just trying out uh, so many things. And uh, there's the perception that many African societies are pre patriarchal, like I said. Nigeria is one of such societies. However, when you had marriage, and sex to the mix and stare. Patriarchy is dissented. In Yoruba ethnic Southwest Nigeria, wife is married not just to her husband, but to the family of her husband. And she's allowed to move her body and sexuality across family spaces, like choosing to have sex with any male member of the family except her male children. Of course, I, I must say that you don't have uh, sex with your own offspring. And the offspring of such relationship or intercourse becomes the child of the husband or the family since she's married to the family. In specific spaces like Ondo town in Yoruba, that is in Southwest Nigeria, West Africa, women and men publicly embrace concubinage as a form of marital and sexual freedom. It was also a metric of marrying elitism and nobility. As where women had the power to negotiate fatherhood of their children across marriages, all this had up to water down sex policy. Fluid sex policy and procreation unveils agency in reframing women and gender issue in Africa. Non-stringent sex roles allowed women to move their bodies across physical and contextual spaces. Relationship marriage and even negotiate fatherhood of their children. Overall, my work now. It aims to bring additional perspectives to the teaching of gender and sexuality in Africa, especially the implication of micro approach on the overall framework of gender epistemology. So my micro approach now is talking about marriage, it's talking about sex. So my micro is not about space, really is about concept. So how do you use marriage and sex to discuss gender in African history? Yeah, and uh, also, um, it will contribute to repositioning patriarchy in marriage by culturally validating women's agency in many traditional histories. And I hope it will contribute to reduce weaponization of marriage against women. And I have this uh, research questions. Yeah, how can fluid conjugality and sexuality be used to explain agency in Nigeria? Like since women could have children to more than one husband and, we, and decide to claim this patriarchy that's you don't do what you want. You don't have your way in everything. So how do you use that to extend the debate of agency, female agency in Nigeria? What processes or practices enabled female agency in fleet conjugality, like sex? Of course. Then what is movement in the context of fleet conjugality? So I'm talking about body movement now. How, how is a woman able to move her body from one uh, partner to another partner and uh, what, how, how, how does she kind of enjoy it? How is it seen? How is society accepting it? How, how is it generally like? And how uh, did fluid conjugality enable female agency? When and why did it become abhorrent? So since we have families everywhere having such women, such wives, you know, with children from different husbands, why is it that it's so abhorrent now? Why is it that everybody talks about patriarchy like it's been there? then how can it be deployed to reduce weaponization of marriage uh, against women? Yes, so I uh, stop sharing now. Um, uh, so this is, this is my work and this is to show the essence to which it is very, very important to use uh, specificity to engage African history, to engage African studies so that the world will not continue to regard Africa as a country when it's a continent. Thank you.
All right. Thank you to both of you for, for great presentations. And, and I love how complimentary they were in terms of the things that you, you covered. And thanks for sharing also of your own work. Um, I, I love the phrase body movement to describe what you're talking about because it takes it away from is a kind of patriarchal, maybe religiously based um, moral way of describing the same thing, right? It's not kind of like a moral choice or an ethical choice, but it's phys like physically body movement, right? Like one of the most basic things you have agency over is where to put your body, right? So that that's a really interesting conceptual framing. Um, I um, I want to open it up to questions. I, I certainly have a lot of my own, but I don't. I want to stop myself from talking too much. Uh, does anyone have questions or comments or reactions to either Luashola or Ibrahim's uh, presentation and the information that they shared? Don't be shy. Sherry, are you are you trying to talk to us or? I just wanted to make sure that students had a chance to, if any students wanted to ask before oh, yeah. I have a question. And also, if you if you feel more comfortable typing it in the chat, you can type it in the chat. We can uh, we can read it out loud. Craig, do you have a question? Comment? No. No, no, I, I don't. I thought it was, they were really great presentations and I appreciate uh, them coming in and enlightening uh, some of the faculty and some of the students. So welcome, uh, you know, awesome. Thanks so much. Great. Uh, Alicia Perez just wrote uh, really eye-opening remarks about female sexuality in, in Africa. Well, I have a specific question that about food production. You mentioned that Africa feeds itself and it got me thinking um, about Nigeria as a petroleum producer and comparing it to some other countries that are petroleum producers like Venezuela, for example, which has an environment and water resources enough that it could produce its own food, but it doesn't because of the global economy of petroleum and how petroleum functions internally. Does Nigeria also feed itself and export food? And if so, uh, how was it able to escape that kind of petroleum dynamic of shifting away from agriculture to, um, to just petroleum income? Okay, yeah. So generally, um, Africa feeds itself, but um, like just everywhere, that's no country is self-sufficient. So you still have them importing one or two things from outside the country. And um, as regards petroleum, yes, there's a region called the Niger Delta, right? In Nigeria, where petroleum is produced how to, you know, for exportation out of the country. And that region, it has, uh, you know, because of all this Chevron, all these big oil companies coming in there to, um, to take the oil, and because of environmental hazards, so it has uh, it has impacted on the environment. There's oil spill, so there's problem, environmental problem for those living in that region. But um, definitely, that's just a region. That's just like a drop in the ocean, right? So you have food production in places outside Niger Delta. So Niger Delta is I I, I can't even put it in a percentage because. It's, it's, very, it's a very small portion out of Nigeria. So you have food production in the northern part. So Niger Delta is in South South. So you have food production in the northern part. You have food production in the eastern. You have food, food production in the southwest. And that's that the people hate. So, you know, just imagine having to eat the, the, the like the major food now. One of the common foods is jam. Mm -hmm. We call it jam, we call it Gary. So those imagine those foods that everybody needs to eat and imagine it being imported from like America, United States. So definitely everybody won't be able to buy it. So everybody will die of hunger. So if Nigeria won't be able to give itself basic food, so definitely Nigeria feeds itself. So those places where you find the oil, 
they have that challenge of uh, producing food. So they usually get their foods from other sections of the mm -hmm. country. Yeah, so that is it about that. Great, thank you. Uh, Craig, you have your hand up? Yeah, I, you know, I couldn't formulate a question when you put me on the spot, but your question and kind of just thinking about it, uh, you know, I, I thought I'd ask about something that maybe the speakers, you know, it's not maybe their, what they're studying or kind of their research and those kind of things, but, you know, the, the video and kind of a larger discussion of, you know, African studies and the, the average American's perception of Africa or, you know, I deal with it. I'm a geographer and, you know, people have are ignorant to the map, let alone that, you know, Africa has modernity and those kind of things. And I, I just wonder if you guys have run into um, efforts or research that tr is trying to to maybe change that perception more so in the K-12 system is what I'm thinking, Mike, you know, that somehow we've, we've continued along as this country that we have, we produce students in the public school system that don't know these things because they're not exposed. So I don't know, that's kind of a weird question kind of all over, but do you, do you know of any movements in that? And I thought about that in relation to, you know, higher education, people that are trying to, to move the conversation forward, I guess. Okay, like, do we know of any movement that does what? That's trying to, um, you know, promote, I guess, promote more like global education, but to, to, to get rid of that whole idea that we know most Americans have this stilted or slanted or uneducated view of, you know, and I've even saying of Africa, like it's some sort of monolith, but, you know, of, of other places. Yeah, so, so here's the thing, everybody, everybody, everybody kind of ha uh, has this this notion about Africa I, I let me put it the word as notion about Africa so like I told you when I first had my class I asked that question what do you think of Africa what do you know of Africa so everything on that just they gave it to me and even more so and you know it's not really possible for everyone to take a big microphone and, or to start putting it, even if you put it on the social media every day, people will still not see it. So the specificity is something that we continue saying. We continue keeping active. We, we continue giving to the public, like this is it, this is what it is, this is what Africa is, this is what Africa is not. So I believe the set of my students and or, you know, of maybe the other students and when we have people like, you know, me, Ibrahim, and many other Africans, maybe, maybe just maybe this, you know, misconceptions about Africa might reduce. So that's just my thinking. I don't know, I, I, of course, I don't know of any other, you know, uh, sources that could bring up that awareness. But for us of now, that is what I know is in the pipeline. Thank you. If I may briefly add to that, um, so so two things for me. I before I came to grad school, um, I I work in a in the public policy sector, uh, and I spent some time working with think tanks in Washington D.C. So, from my experience in the public policy and my experience in academia, I see two things when it comes to how the global north, particularly in this case, Americas, sort of engage Africa. One is that we see a lot of money. From American tax donors going to Africa to study, you know, the pertinent questions like poverty, like climate change, and whatnot, or even basic anthropological questions. That is one. A lot of money coming from from you guys going to Africa. Then, second, in the academia, we've seen a lot of donation from um, groups like you know the Carnegie, you know the Mellon, the Ford Foundation, put into humanities research that eventually produced these beautiful dissertations that that now turned into monograph published by, you know, academic press. In other words, the major or the, you I say safely, the major or the most uh, popular monographs on African studies are produced by, you know, African American, oh, sorry, African, I'm sorry, American scholars or scholars in the global north. So you have all this money, you guys are giving to Africa, and you have all this knowledge you're producing about Africa, but none of these two is really translating into correcting impressions about Africa in America itself. So you go to high schools or elementary school and you still see students you know, not, not you know, sufficiently understanding what Africa is, but we, we cannot relegate the influence of the social media and how it's really correcting many of this impression because a child in you know, Sacramento High School 
who has had access to Instagram can all can see, you know, influencers from, from Ghana, from Lagos, and see that their environment is actually in this way, which conflicts with what's perhaps what they've known in the American society to be of Africa. So yeah, they are, they are, they are, they are production of scholarly work that addressed the correction of this, you know, uh, of this, you know, misrepresentation of Africa, but many of these scholarship have not been simplified to go into K-12 or to go into even the most elementary of schools in the US. They are still stuck in the academia. We, we create this um, esoteric works that only speaks to the academia without, you know, being able to speak to, you know, the basic American on the streets and create that impression of Africa. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and, and, and to, to quickly add to that, to quickly add to that, I, I see that that is a big problem because even the 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 the, the weight the the breadth of that scholarship produced in North America only hands in should I say stops in the West. Let me use the West at least for Europe. It doesn't so much go into Africa, so you don't have that interaction. So it's always congealed in like in a place, always compartmentalized in a place. Probably there are gatekeepers everywhere. So because you know publishers. And um, you know all these uh, problems with uh, uh, the knowledge itself is simplifying the knowledge. So that has you know made it to be kind of difficult for people, for everybody on the street to have access to it. So I think I, th I think something needs to be done to 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 decenter that 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 compartmentalization of knowledge so that everybody can know what's really happening. Because I must say this: th there are many of those. Uh, scholarships that I never even knew until I got here. I got to UC Davis last year, September, and I, I, I could say that many of things written on Africa that I never knew myself. Well, of course, I'm an African woman. I can't, I can't say otherwise. So that, that is something that needs to really be addressed. Thank you. I love where we went in this conversation because I think we're talking about democratization of information and knowledge and it, you know, Professor Cherry Patton is here and she's been teaching the African Civ course at City College. And a lot of times people will say, we don't need an African history course at the community college level, right? Even the CSUs and the UCs don't like the, the idea too much, but that's part of kind of um, disseminating and de democratizing information and knowledge about Africa and other places to make sure that it's not just happening at the community colleges, but it's happening at High schools too, if not earlier. Sherry, are you gonna hold on? Um, so I can't remember the name of it, but it's it was out of UC Davis. Now it wasn't about African history, it's about US history, but it was an institute where they actually made um collab they collaborated with K-12 um teachers. It was a it was a brilliant program because there's also I mean, there's of course the problem of not, not enough knowledge generated by Africans themselves, dominated obviously the whole field. But there's also the question of taking that information from academia and getting it down to the K-12. Because even in the K-12 curriculum here in California, there is stuff on Africa, but you know what it is? It's Mansa Musa, of course, right? So you really need scholars like yourselves who, who can in some ways interface. And that's just asking you to do more than you already have to do, which is a ton of stuff anyway. But it is, it, it, that, I can't remember the name of the program, but it was a great program where it did take scholars uh, from, U, from UC Davis specifically uh, to, to interface with the K-12s. Yeah, well, maybe we can revive that. Yeah. Specifically in relation to, to African studies and African history. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Otherwise, you know me, I'm gonna take it to food. No, I'll, t I'll ask another one too. You ask another one, no one does. I have I have many questions, so. Go ahead, you go ahead, Sherry. Well, I don't know which one to ask first. I think I, I, I'll ask about the, the marriage first because I think, I think uh, uh, myself and maybe some other people might need just a tiny explanation about how they would be married to more than one husband and this this the, the term concubine i always have a difficult time explaining i think for americans you're like a concubine is that like a slave is that a prostitute or what is a concubine so if you could just give us a little more on that 
Yes, yes, I, I, I remember that too. I remember uh, studying something on concubinage, I think, because I did. I, I can't remember when, and um, uh, it's all about West African women as concubines across North Africa, Middle East, and all of it like that. So that could give that a kind of skewed meaning to concubine. So the, being married to more than one husband is this. So it goes to the kind of marriage in Africa. So the kind of marriage in Africa, in, or should I say in Nigeria specifically, is such that when the marriage is being celebrated or the wedding is on, so you have a union of the family of the bride and the groom. So you don't just have the, the bride and groom at the wedding. So you have the two families and you have celebrations that must seal, seal the two families together. And there's the body movement. So the body movement in the sense that right from the place of that ceremony, the family, the wives in the family of the husband, the, the groom, must, especially talking about uh, traditional period, must be the one to take the wife from that venue to her husband's house. Mm. So that's like the, the taking the possession of that woman from that venue to her husband's house. So while at that husband's house, there are some cultures that allow the woman to have sexual intercourse with any member of a husband's family. It could be except, except, except for our own uh, uh, female, uh, our own male offspring rather, our own male offspring. So that culture allows any of the man to have intercourse. And after that, after that intercourse, of course, you have pregnancy, you have children, definitely the child would become the child of the husband. Right. And in rare instances, in rare instances when the husband may not even want the child, the child belongs to that family. So the child cannot leave that family. So because the family has married the woman out of the family. Yeah. Okay. So and about concubinage, Concubinage in, uh, in, in Yoruba is very, very interesting because when you talk, there's a particular, uh, should I call it subet, uh, subethnic or like a group called the Ondo. So in Ondo town, you have the, the, the elite, the, the nobles, especially the female, the influential women, even uh, men, even up till now, saying that, oh, that's my, that's my Hali. That is, that's my concubine. That's my concubine going. Like that's the person because there is the word criminality is not there. So when you when you when you put criminality there, that is when you have a uh, concubinage in the sense of the global you know meaning of it, concept of it. Okay, or maybe I should put it this way that the word ale may not mean the general concubinage that everybody knows. Okay, maybe, but as of now, the closest word I could give to it for this presentation is concubinage. Okay, but it does not have that criminality that everybody knows of it of now because the woman could have could go on to have a, 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 a affair outside the marriage with anybody she wants as far as of course she's able to do that and carry on with her life the consequences because in most cases uh, the, even if any any child comes out of such marriages she will definitely have to cater for that child and not the husband's family. And even if she wants to move to another family, she's allowed to do that. And I've discovered that when you look at one, two, three, four, five families across that Yoruba Southwest Nigeria, you will find at least one or two women having children to more than one husband. So there must be something to it. So that's where my own research comes from. Um, Ibrahim, I want, want to ask you, you, you emphasize so much of like the cultural, the breadth of sort of the cultural topics and ecological topics, etc. I, I recall sometimes we have at the college global uh, cooking classes and food events and we, we had a Nigerian cooking class that, that um, one of our former students led. And I was so struck by the complexity 
of Nigerian cuisine and uh, all the different flavors and ingredients and I'm just shocked that it's not recognized globally, you know, like French cuisine or other complex cuisines with rich histories and ingredients. Do you, do you, um, do you find that there's interest in those kinds of cultural topics or recognition even of, of that kind of, and again, it's, it's specific, right, to a region. I'm sure that there are many other also like really rich cuisines that we have no idea of in the U.S. because we, we lose from that miseducation and that, and that um, ignorance, right? Absolutely correct. And um, this for some of the questions, one of the key questions in postcolonial studies, uh, the question of how the, the, the fabric of uh, extracting uh, customs from, from the natives and superimposing the colonial cultures, the cultures from the metropolis on the natives. So for example, when the French came to West Africa, when the British came to West Africa, not only were they interested in removing the religious beliefs from the people, the spiritual belief, they also want to subject them to European values like food, like the imposition of European food and making the natives to see those food as the ideal food, as the food that are the best. The, the, when you eat those food, when you have them in your house, you are performing some kind of, you know, demonstrating some kind of wealthiness, some kind of modernity. In, 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 in other words, the modernization of Africa also has to do with the removal of indigenous uh, food as something that, has, that that enforce identity and imposition of, you know, European food as this new acceptable modern you know, identity. So that's that superimposition, of course, has moved um, since since independence. And of course, the European, you know, in practice left. But the framework that that orientation created still persists. Uh, so much that if you come to West Africa today, at least in Nigeria, Ghana, and Togo, uh, among you know, even generation of my my dad, like people that had the 70s, they still see the access to European food or cuisine as a demonstration of, you know, you know you've been wealthy, you've been modern. And uh, that reinforces this kind of, you know, personal subjectivity to anything that is foreign. And uh, of course, as you said, this Nigerian or Ghanaian food are fascinating, uh, but, but they are not up until like maybe five, maybe 10 years ago, they didn't really make it to the, uh, you know, the mainstream, the mainstream, uh, uh, the mainstream of a global definition of you know the best food or the most acceptable food, uh, because you know we Africans as well we've we've sort of you know relegated our own food and you know our own values, and you know take this European as the ideal one. But recently, the last ten years, with the advent of social media, uh, we've seen that rejuvenation of you know of indigenous foods like jollof rice or the, you know, the, the fufu. And uh, of course, thank God to the sort of this new renaissance or wokeness among, you know, African-Americans. And now they've pushed for the rethinking of African food as part of their own African-American identity as well. I mean, you go to New Orleans, a lot of the food you eat there from, you know, you know Congo or from Nigeria, or from Yoruba land. So that new thinking, that rejuvenation of that, oh wait, our identity as African-Americans or our identity as Africans, or even in the academia, the so-called decolonization of knowledge, all this thing has to do with rethinking food as well. And thinking our food reinforces identity or our food, in other words, could reinforce you know, this colonial mentality. So yeah, in the last 10 years we've seen that, you know, apology to, to African food, to New York Times, you know, having this section devoted to African food, to all these, you know, stations like Al Jazeera, CNN taking, you know, initiative to go and investigate local cuisines. So yeah, you're absolutely right, uh, uh, Prof Riyad. It, it's it's so much about our identity, and I'm so glad that you know we are now rejuvenating that. Yeah, and if I could add to that, this is my reason for adding to this because I'm I'm fortunate. Um, for last quarter winter, I I I tiered for a course. Uh, called um, Food History. So why we yeah, are Food History by uh, Professor Sally Mackey, uh, the current chair of history at UC Davis. So why uh, the, the TN for that course, I discovered that all the foods are from 
Asia, you know, you trace coffee to Asia, uh, United States, Japan, you know, the introduction of the fork and all of it to Europe. Then I asked myself, Africa never had anything. Why is it that Africa is not eating? Nobody's eating everything in Africa. So I was I was kind of disturbed, like I've been teaching, you know, different civilizations, nothing said about Africa. Then uh, I uh, like three weeks to the end of the course. Then the professor said, this is going to be our final project, final paper. You're going to work on uh, the introduction of African foods into American prison. That is the cooking by African Americans in different restaurants in Africa, uh, in America. And that goes to show that while you know, reading the books, I discovered that the basis, the basics, the bedrock of the cuisine, the American cuisine is from the African Americans brought in through transatlantic slave trade. And because they worked as domestic servants in the kitchen, they became kitchen managers such that when slavery ended, they started their restaurant across different parts. So that's why there was even one particular food they called red rice. So that red rice is our fried rice, is our jollof rice rather. So that red rice is our jollof rice. So I, I told them in class, I said, this is not in your book, but you need to know that this red rice with these ingredients, with the, all of this cuisine is our own jollof rice. So the only thing missing in this red rice is uh, the, the chili peppers. So we eat peppers a lot in Africa, but I'm very sure in North America, they don't eat as much spicy food. So we eat chili peppers. So that is the difference. So mm -hmm. I kind of, yeah, I kind of think that there's the need for that specificity that this is what is obtainable in Africa. And this is the root of all these things. Okay, so that when you see them, you know that it's not like somebody has been, you know, removed or somebody is not eating, but the fact that, there's this kind of assimilation that has brought everybody and everything together. I love, I love ending on this note, on the note of kind of pan-African decolonization and ed education through food. Another question, are we done? We're done, unfortunately. Oh, we, we I can... wanted to ask Ibrahim another question, a history question. Oh, I um, unfortunately we have to end because there's another session starting. Oh, another session. And, but this just tells us we have to bring them both back, and hopefully next time in person, and we'll we'll continue the conversation oh, yes. in that way. Thank that you so much to to both of you and to everyone for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.